Okay, so I'm recording the session, and good news, this week is going to be really fun, because we're finally going to talk about OIP. Let me share my screen with you. There we go. Um, so this week, OIP, we're going to talk about encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. But first, we will discuss last week's homework. I heard some people who were busy doing last week's homework um, this afternoon. That's really good. Maybe you guys can help me because I kind of forgot the exercise I was going to make you do. I can look it up real quick. Maybe you can tell me what you were supposed to start with. I think it was something um, like some logic for deciding what team is winning or something like that. Yes, so getting in the chat, write a method in game that decides what team is winning the game and store that in score. Okay. So let's move over to game. Um, the idea is that we are going to decide what team is winning. Well, we have two teams. We have a home team and we have an out team. And somehow we need to decide which of them is winning. Um, I heard some people that used math random for this and that's really good. But first let's make the method. So I think a public method would be nice, right? Should it return something? Looking in the chat, should it return something? Score, optional. Yeah, so you could decide that this method should return the team that is winning or the score that is being set. But since I'm going to modify my instance, I'm not going to return anything because um, I'll be just modifying the game object. And based on that, you can see what happened. But name of the winning team or the team who's winning, that would have all been valid choices, but I'm just going to go for void. So it doesn't really matter what you pick as long as you thought about it. Um, well, deciding who's winning, usually that's called playing the game, right? So let's call this method play game. Do we need to send any in? Oh, I've done some C sharp. Okay, you guys see it? Play game with lowercase. Um, should I have input parameters for this method? Yes, I think so. What would you send uh, in? I would send in the name of the teams that are playing and probably the winning score. That's possible. Oh. So if I really want to uh, set the teams and set the score, I could actually give those to this method. But I am in the game class here and game has teams, or I suppose it has okay. as soon as I yeah. get to game. Yeah. But maybe yeah. it would be good to check whether they're not null or something. Hmm. Um, we'll actually see this next week a bit. We'll see the difference between static and non-static. Okay. And then these kind of questions are easier to answer. So yes, okay. I decided to send it all in. But then again, I'm going to be lazy. I'm just going to figure, well, it's probably been set for me so I can use these. <laughs> So how to decide? I heard some um, suggestions this afternoon that seemed valid to me in the Dutch app group. Some people said, um, yeah, I use random values for this. And that actually makes a lot of sense because you can use random values to decide who's winning. Let me show you this. So we have um, a certain function called math.random and this will give me back a double. Um, let's call it... Uh, Okay, spending way too much time on this. It's definitely, okay, so double um, who's winning. Oh yes, yeah, so you can also do, yeah. Um, well, ch just call it chance. And this is going to be math.random. And this function um, gives back, oh, I'll zoom in a bit. Maybe that's helpful as well. Gives back a double between zero and one. 
I could also have used, I see this in the chat, the new random object that would have also been fine. Um, but I'm lazy and this is easier. So this gives me back a number between zero and one. And what I'm then going to say is that if a chance is smaller than uh, 0 0.5, which is uh, arguably the middle, then we can say then the winning team is going to be home team and else the winning team is going to be the out team. So let's have a look at score. Um, a score has int points for home team and points for out team. So based on the score, we could probably derive who's actually winning here. But we could also give the game a winning team if we'd like. So we could have a, um, a team, oops, I tend to do this during these sessions, a team winner like this. So I could say if um, chance is smaller than 0 0.5, then winner equals home team. And else winner equals out team. Does that make sense? I get a question, why 0 0.5? Well, it gives back a chance, but uh, it gives back a double between zero and one. So 0 0.5 is the middle. So I giving them equal chances, but if I would want it to have bigger chance for the home team, I could have made this um, 0.6. That would have been 60, 40. Uh, Micah, I have a doubt about math.random. Uh, can I go please, ahead? Please share. Yeah. Uh, so we do, uh, we are assuming that it should give a value between zero and one, but because it's a random function, uh, will it uh, stay between zero and one? Um, let's see how it does that. So you can go to the actual code. And yeah, I okay. it gives some number between zero and one, but how it does that, um, I think it's using, it's using the system time or something. Okay, but, but then is there a limit on this function itself that it stays between zero and one? Is, does uh, it behave like that? Yes, it does. Okay, um, okay. Okay. Yeah, because it's calling something here, I think. So if we just... Oh, largest double value. Next double. It's using bits over here times double units. I'm honestly not sure, but I know that mm -hmm, it gives mm -hmm. back a number between zero okay. and one. Okay, then I will uh, yeah check it out later. And yes. if I have a question, I will ask you. Yeah. Yes, Thank yes. You. It's interesting, though, to look into how yeah. random numbers are generated. Because yeah. how do you make a random number? And I'm yeah. honestly not sure, but I, I think mm -hmm. or I suppose that this would uh, take system time. But then again, maybe okay. it doesn't. I'm not sure. Okay, but because it's a double and that's why it does something related to double, I guess. Um, yes, yes, exactly. And uh, I just know that this function gives back a, a double yeah. zero and one. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Um, so if the chance, if the home team, oh yes. Yeah. So now we need to generate some sort of score, right? Um, and store that in the score. So, so how did you guys um, come up with a score? I'm curious to see how you solved it. <laughs> yes, fair enough. So Leon says, I've used the above line and... Uh, okay, so he's generating numbers between zero and five. That kind of makes sense, right? Because more than five is not a very likely score for a match. And less than zero is also not possible. So that makes sense. Um, oh, that's quite nicely done. So let, let's go for Leon's uh, construction over here or we could be, no i'm not gonna be lazy well it's tempting though uh let's go so set the return score and then you have i think this as some sort of method right leon you inserted this in some method that is called generate number between zero and five um, public int tada. There we go. Mm. 
So random is also a class you could use for this. And then how do you control that the highest one is going to the winning team? Ah, oh, so that's clever. So Leon did it the other way around. He generated the scores and then he was just going to check who by accident won. Am I correct, Leon? Yes. Oh, that would also have been fun. Yes, so this is what Leon did. It's fun. I love it when I give these fake exercises. You guys come all up with these original solutions. So he said, well, I need some sort of score. Score, score is new score. That's what he started off with. And then he said this pretty much. There you go. Mine probably. Oh yeah, this is already nicely encapsulated. I don't have that yet. So I have to rewrite this next week because we are going to learn about encapsulation really soon after this one. Who has lost me? Please uh, let me know. So now we have a score object and we need to assign this score object to this score object because we want to change the score of our game. So instead of saying score score is new score, I could have said this.score equals new score and I'm setting our object. And then we still need some sort of if statement. We don't need them at random anymore, but we're going to have to say if score points for home uh, for out team is smaller than score for home team well then the, the home team has one right but then we need another else because it could be tie so or what's it called in football i don't know but at least that they have the same score so then we can say if it's the other way around like this Um, the winner is the out team. And actually we don't want to not have a conclusion. So we can say that we just call the method again if it's the same score. Who still likes me in this room? Do you understand this one here? Uh, yeah, it's calling the same function over again. Yes, so if they by accident got in the same score, it's just going to call the same function again until they don't. Okay. It's like replay, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or extra time, or how do you call it? Hmm. So this is just one of the million solutions you could have chosen. Oh, now I'm getting a question. Is there any shuffle method in Java to shuffle an array? Uh, yes, there is. And Arno says it's potentially an infinite loop. Yes. Well, not really. I mean, technically, if you just create random ints, then you should always hop out at some point. Um, so first, the shuffle array before I forget. Uh, let's go here. We have an array somewhere still. No, we don't. Let's make one. Like this. And we have the arrays. Um, I think it's on this one. There's something called shuffle or let's see what we have. I know there's a collections.shuffle. Equals fail hash code mismatch. Mm. So you can sort it. I figured you could shuffle it. Maybe you do have this one, the collections shuffle, but you have to insert a list, but you can say strings 
Oh, I'm not sure if this is allowed. Let's try this. Um, yeah, this way. Can you do that? No. S list. I'll have to look this up. Oh, so I have to go for arrays as lists in here then. Arrays as list strings like this. I think this will work. Let's try it. Yeah, so this will work. I was a bit scared this might throw an exception, but it doesn't, so it's fine. Let me copy this to the chat. And Leon is saying, we're not allowed to use that yet. We're not, but we did do collections. Oh no, I made the presentation for collections last Monday, but we didn't do it yet. No, so so we didn't discuss this. It's not here. Quick. Um, I got a more on topic question and it was about generate the random numbers between zero and five. What does this do? Well, this thing is a method and it's called generate random numbers between zero and five. And it's giving us back an int value. You can see it here, it's returning an int. And then it's returning, and this is a long thing, which you're probably also not allowed to use yet, Leon, while we're talking about it. No, you could have done this in many ways. But what we're doing here is we're creating a new random value of type int. Um, and we're saying, we only want to create one. It can start at zero and shouldn't be uh, six or higher, so it's um, I said it's an it's a it's a range, but it's exclusive, so it's exclus excluding the last value. And then we're just saying get the first one, get it as an int value. So this is just generating a random number. So you can so you can see here this is an int stream, and it's just uh, it's creating ints to put into some sort of stream. So it's a built-in method to create a random integer value. But I can imagine it looks a bit uh, intimidating. So this was only the first step of the homework, I guess. Because I also said, write a method in round that randomly assigns teams to games and plays the game. Right, yes. Who managed to do this? Leon managed to do so. See some people looking worried. Don't be worried, we can do it together. So we are gonna go to our round method, our class here. And what we'll be doing here, our round should have some sort of um, teams array, I think, because we didn't do lists yet. No, so our round has um, pretty much two things, participating teams to the round and certain games that are being played. So let's make a teams and let's make, um, what did it say, game array like this. So we need these as properties of round. And then I'm going to make a method and I'm going to make this void for now. And I'm going to say play round like this. What we need to do, we need to play all the games in our round. So these are all the games we are going to play and these are all the teams that we can use for that. So actually the um, question I just got from Dinesh, I think, asking how to shuffle an um, array would be useful here because if we shuffle the array it's random and then we can just go over it by the way it's ordered because the order is random so that's one option or you're going to generate random values using the length of the array so these are the two um, options pretty much that we're having here and a round number did i come up with a round number or well, let's give it a round number. So string 
round name, round number. Um, so right now I'm actually thinking, hmm, this was not so clever of me actually, because now when I'm going to play the games, I am going to call or play game method we just um, wrote here. And kind of thinking of it, what I would want it to return is the winning game. So I can actually use that in round as some feedback later for what teams have won so they can go to the next round. So in tournament later, we are going to create a method that runs all the rounds, but then we need to know who the winners are. So, well, we have multiple options, but I think the easiest is if we say team winners like this. And then here in our game method, we are going to return the winning team like this. Um, return winner. Yes, that seems fine. Uh, return winner. So we're going to go to rounds. And here we are going to say for every um, game in games, we are going to assign two teams to it. And then we're going to say play the game like this. But first we have to say who the home team is and who the out team is. I'm just putting in null now because I can't really look at all these red lines for too long. So how are we going to decide who is going to be playing? Any ideas? I think I'm going to go for Dinesh's question. Or is that cheating? That is cheating, right? If I use the collections that shuffle. So, um, yes, that is cheating. So we need two things, actually. We need to make sure that um, the teams that we're having, there are twice as many teams as we have games. Um, so I'm getting some in chat. Oh, okay. Yes, so... Um, what Leon did, he got random teams, but then how did you make sure that you only got every team once? He didn't. Okay. So we're going to do something like that, but then we're also going to make sure that we're only getting every team once. And we're going to do this. Um, yeah, it's going to be very painful for performance. Mm, how to do it? without using lists, because if you have lists, it's life is much easier, but we don't have them yet. So I only have arrays. Yes. Um, if I'm going to cheat, I'm going to cheat the easy way. So I'm going to cheat. Sorry, guys. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this one over here. So I'm just going to shuffle our teams. <laughs> Dina is encouraging me to just go ahead and cheat a little bit. Come on, import. There we go. So now um, what we should probably check, but what I'm not going to check is whether we indeed have enough teams to play all these games, else we're going to get some sort of array index out of bounds uh, error. Um, and then I'm going to rewrite this to the old way. So, because I need the i. So I'm going to say int i is zero. And as long as i smaller than the games.length, I'm going to say go to the next game. And then here I'm going to say or, um, let's see, games. I, yes, like this, because the first time the uh, game will be uh, zero. So it's the first element of the array. Second time it's one. So it's the second game, etc. So and then here I'm going to say something different and please see if you follow along. So for the first one, I'm going to say I like this. I'm actually still thinking what I'm going to say for the second one. Because if I say I plus one, I'm going to lose track of it, clearly. 
Mm. Mm. So this needs to be something else. Who can help me? So if I say I plus one, this is going to be fine the first round, right? Because this is zero. So it's going to grab team zero and it's going to grab teams one. But then the second round, it is going to grab teams one again and then here teams two. And that's not what we want. You want zero, one, two, three, etc. So I think what we should be doing is two times I, but I'm a bit tired and I'm not too sure. Please let me know if this was not a good idea. Can we do a nested loop, like run the I loop for games and the J loop for teams? Will that work or is that a bad idea here? Um, yeah, I don't think it will help because we don't need, to, we either need to do it for all the teams or we need to do it for all the games. And maybe yeah. hindsight using it would have been easier to use teams that length and just to have the games because that would have been possible. But I think the first time, so let's just let's just do four and then assume after that's gonna be fine, right? Yeah. So the first time, zero, this is going to be one. Okay, so then next iteration, I is one. This is going to be two, and this is going to be three. Next iteration, yeah, so I'm gonna, no, so this is still fine. So I is two, so this is going to be four, and this is going to be five. Next iteration is going to be, yeah, it's gonna be fine. Don't you guys think so? Yes. All very convincing. I know it's Saturday night. <laughs> we're, I don't think we're all as sharp as we are during the rest of the week, but I think this looks fine. Do you guys get it? Because it's a funky syntax. And it's actually <laughs> much harder than that it's going to be later in the course when we have more tools in our toolbox. Well, you all seem fine. Um, so this is the play round. Um, all right, so I am playing the round, but I'm not storing the winner yet. So the play game is right now giving back the winner of the game. So actually I can say, um, yeah, and I can't really say that, can I? So at play round, I'm going to say winners is new team. And then the length is going to be teams.length divided by two, right? I guess. Something like this. And then here I'm going to say winners i equals this. And then we'll have winners at the end of our round. Does that make sense? Okay, let's move on to the next. So this is actually the same thing again. So right now we're going to have a rounds array here because the tournament has many rounds. So let's go for round over here. And then we are going to make a method uh, public avoid play tournaments because here we're going to fire off the entire tournament. We can actually cheat a bit and have a look at how we did this at round because it's going to be very similar, except it, um, for that we're only going to have one winner here. So I'm just going to steal this. And we have a team winner and the losers, there are clearly more of them. But we only have one winner. And the winner is the one as long as the... Let's see. So how can we do this? I think we'll need... An array of winners? Nah, no. Yeah, I think this will be fine. So we have an array of winners and we have an array of teams participating. But we know that in the end, our winner, um, our winners uh, array, it's only going to be of length one because we only want one winner of the tournament, not two, right? Um, so we're going to start here. And again, we're going to say something very similar, but now instead of making uh, games, we are going to do the same thing, but then for rounds um, like this. And instead of sending teams in, we are going to send 
games in, I guess. Let's see. No, actually, it's easier. We only need to say here. Um, so we're going to have some sort of round object. And then we're going to say on that round object, play round. And this play round, it should give back an array of winning teams. It doesn't do that yet though. So let's go here and change it. And then here we are going to say, return the winners like this. And then here, um, no, here, we are constantly overriding um, the winning team for every round. So then we know when we're done, when there's only one winner. So we can then just say that winners equals uh, winner. Uh, that's clearly out of bounds. Let's go like this. Oh, it's way too difficult, I think. I can just say this, that winners. Like this. Yes, and then after the last iteration, uh, this winner set should only have length one, and then we would be done playing the tournament. But we need to set round somehow, right? And in order to set round, we need to give round uh, games and teams. Does that make sense? Actually, I don't want to. Do I? Don't I? Um, could you explain what you don't understand, Daniela? So that I. Um, I think what I last said was that tournaments need to have teams and games, right? So in our winners are all the teams that are currently still in the match. So the first time I'm going to play the game, I'm going to say winners equals all the teams. And then here on our round object, um, I don't need to create one actually. I can just say rounds um, I. And then we're going to say the teams equals all the winners. We can send these in. And games, we don't need them really in tournament, I think, because we have rounds and rounds of games. So they can go here because we can access all the games via the rounds object. And then I think I can actually already say that I should play. Um, what do you think? Will this work? So we instantiate our winners at all the teams that are participating. And then we're just going to play all the rounds of the tournaments. And the result of every round is a new set of winners. Uh, so Leon asks, where do you create rounds and teams? Um, yeah, I'm not sure either yet. So we could either create them here, hard-coded, or we could maybe load them in from some file at a later stage. Or you could make static methods to initialize everything. Or you could do it in, yeah, you could do it in the constructor. Yes, so let's, so I broke this, let's see. Oh, okay, yeah, so this is in our app, that's fine. So we have the tournament here. Yeah, I think this should work. I'm actually not going to do all the typing right now. Oh. Okay, let's see then. Um... Yes, I'm just going to turn this off. But it should be something like this. I can send you over the code if you like, so you can uh, test it, because it's very possible that we have a minor bug in here somewhere. Um, I 
Okay, so I'm getting some questions if I can explain the steps of play tournament. So play tournament is here. Well, in order to play a tournament, we need to play rounds. And in these rounds, um, games will be played. But the logic to play games, it's not none of our concern in here because it's actually um, in a game. And in round, we call the play games. So in tournament, we call the play round function. And how this round has will actually be played, that's part of the round class. So here we have the tournament class. And we just say for every round in our tournament, um, set uh, the teams for this round to whoever is still in um, the tournament, who's not out yet. And then we are going to play the round. And the result of the round um, are all the winning teams. And we're going to store them in the dist.winners. And in the next iteration, we're going to override the next round's participating teams with the winners of our last one. And we're going to do this again and again until uh, we're out of rounds. But right now, if you don't put in the exactly right number of rounds and teams, uh, it's going to go wrong. And that's fine for now. Ah, so um, Arno is asking why this in uh, winners? Well, actually, you don't necessarily need it here because I don't have another winner. So this without din, uh, without this disk keyword, it's the exact same question. But if I would have had an input argument here, that would also have been winners, for example. I could have used winners um, to refer to the input parameter and this.winners to refer to the class parameter or to the class variable. Yes? Shall we move on to um, OOP? Yes, all right, sounds good. Um, so I also, uh, does it work now? Good question, Raul. I can send it over to you and you can test it and tell us next week because it's so much typing. It will be uh, 9.30 before I'm done. It should be sort of working at least. Maybe you can write unit tests and stuff to, to verify. So something like this would have been a fine solution to the homework. And for the rest of the session, we're going to be concerned with object-oriented programming. And I already said that's going to be really fun, but we're only going to touch upon it briefly in this session, but I've posted more elaborate video clips on um, the three pillars that I'd like to discuss. So. What is OOP? Well, it stands for Object Oriented Programming. And it pretty much means that uh, programs that they evolve around objects rather than anything else. And it used to be very new uh, some time ago, but right now it's not that new anymore. It just means that you divide the application into sensible objects and that logic and functions are related to objects rather than through some sort of procedure. So, we know three pillars when it comes to OOP. That's encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Or polymorphism, sorry, that's the Dutch pronunciation. Um, encapsulation is the one we're going to start with. And you have seen it already, maybe not in my videos yet, because I try to not to apply it yet. But it's hard. Once you get into Java for too long, it's hard to not have encapsulation. So. Encapsulation is the concept where properties are part of the object. So the property is in control of the values of these objects. Um, they have private access. We've seen the access modifiers last week and private means that it's only accessible from inside the class. So that's the case for the um, well encapsulated properties. They are private, but we do make public methods to access them. So we give it a get method and a set method to get its value and to change its value. Why would you want that? Because if you make a public get and a public set, it's very much the same as public properties, fair enough. But you don't need to use these standard um, getters and setters in the first place. You can uh, put validation into it, or you could even decide to not uh, create a set method, only one to get the value, for example. And it adds a certain layer of security because data cannot be unexpectedly be modified outside the class. And again, the class is in control of its own data. So if you want to change how to set it, how to verify it, you only need to do it in one place because there's only one place where you can actually change it. 
So it's also uh, leading to better maintainable software. Here we see an example. We have the uh, public class dog over here and it has three private properties right now, a private name, a private weight and private color. But luckily we made a public getters and setters. You can see them here, for example, you see public string get name. So this method is returning a string and that's no coincidence. It needs to be returning the type of the value it's talking about well, or a name on top here, it's of type string. So this return type needs to be string. And in order to get the property, you don't need to send input parameters. So these are just empty. Then here we see um, the setter. And we see that it's not returning anything, it's just doing something. And in order to do that, it needs input, some sort of name. This name is also of type string and it's called the same. So here you'll have to use the this keys keyword because if you don't, it's going to assume that you're going to set the input parameter to itself, which is not doing anything useful. And then it's definitely not changing the value of your class. So you have to use this.name equals name. With this.name, you refer to the instance uh, variable. And with just name, you refer to the input parameter. Um, I go into more depth about this um, in the video that will be on YouTube uh, in a few minutes but you can generate them. And I show you the trick on how to do that in the video. So you don't need to do all the typing yourself. Actually later in life, you'll learn you can do this with annotations and no, oh well, let's move on. So the second pillar of OIP is inheritance. And inheritance means that classes can be derived from other classes. So you can have uh, child classes and parent classes. In Java, classes can only have one direct parent class. So for example, if we have an animal class, it can have many child classes. We have a bird as a child class, dog as a child class. Um, I don't know what other animals we were having. But all these child classes, they can only have one direct parent. So they can point to animals as their, or to animal as their parent, but not to multiple parents. Um, let's see. So, so why would you want to do that? Well, this is actually super useful to avoid duplicate code and less duplicate code means better maintainable software, which is something we always want. And also, and this is very useful by having some sort of super or generic type that all these classes, different classes inherit from, you can actually um, bundle these different classes. So you could say later, we'll see that we can uh, make a list. And in this list, we can actually insert very many values. But we can say, well, only animal um, objects are allowed on this list. And then all the objects that inherit for animal, they still classify as animals, so they could be on the list. So by this way, um, you have more control over the program. And we'll later also see generics. And then again, we're going to be very happy that we have inheritance. So how do you do this inheritance trick? Well, it's quite easy. You just insert the extents and then the class that you want to inherit from. So here we have the child class and we say child class extends parent class. That's kind of what's happening here. Um, so, and since this child class is extending dog class, we can use the get color function here, even though it's defined in a different file, namely doc.java, we can just use it here as if it was defined in our own class. That's pretty cool, right? It's good. Any, any questions about this right now? No? Yes? Or yes, it's really cool. Um, what do you mean, Dinesh, with only three in Java? Three pillars of OIP? I wouldn't know any other common one in other languages I'm missing out on. You have nine OIP in C++. I honestly don't know what the other six are. Uh, 
So Shalika is asking, we don't need a reference to the dog object here to invoke cat color. No, we don't, because we are actually a dog object itself in here, because we are a chihuahua and chihuahua is a dog, because it's a child of dog, we can say it's is a dog, which also makes sense. So you only want to extend from classes that you have some sort of is a relationship with. Okay, then last one. And that's polymorphism. And that sounds like a very difficult word, but don't worry, it's not such a difficult concept. It's especially a very difficult word. Um, it's, it's sort of Greek for many shapes and that's exactly what it is. So if you would have some sort of analogy um, in common language, you can refer to subtypes with its um, more generic type. So I could say to you guys, uh, to next week's class, I'll bring my animal. But I could also say to next week's class, I'm going to bring my dog, which is really more specific, but both are still, you could say both, they would both be true. And I could even be more specific and say to next week's class, I'll bring my chihuahua. You will have even have a better understanding of what you can do with the object and bring it to next week's class. I don't have a dog, by the way. Um, but th that's off topic. Now, but, but just by referring to the super, so this polymorphism thing is pretty much referring to a super class while actually being a child class. So what does that look like? Well, not too shocking. So here we see just the regular way. We say Chihuahua C, new Chihuahua. But then here we say dog D is new Chihuahua. So are referring to a dog while actually being a Chihuahua. And that's perfectly fine. You can do that. But there are some limitations though. Because if you remember, I had this um, method on this Chihuahua that was called do tiny dog stuff. But on our Chihuahua D, if you press the dots, you don't get this method do tiny dog stuff. Why? Because all the Java knows is that it is a dog. It doesn't know that's actually a Chihuahua. Because to Java, it's a dog. Same thing, if I would tell you guys, I'll bring my animal to next week's class and you might be allergic for cats. You're not sure yet if you're going to be allergic uh, reaction next week or not. Because you don't know what specific animal I'm bringing. But you do know if I'm bringing an animal that you could probably touch it or feed it and that it will be breeding, stuff like that. Um, so with polymorphism, you can refer to a class with its supertype, but then you only have access to methods specified on the supertype and not to the very specific methods that define this more specific child class. Does that make sense? Oh, I'm getting another question. So Raul is saying, I was wondering, you get the same methods inherit, right? So in what situations would you do that? Um, could you specify? For example, um, the bark method, it makes sense that dog has a method bark and that chihuahua has a method bark and that all these other types of breeds, I don't know, have a method bark as well. But if they all do it the same, we only need to specify how to do that in one class. So instead of having to do it in all these classes, as soon as we, I don't know, globally change the way that dogs bark or something, we don't need to change it in a hundred places, but only in one, because this bark method is only being defined in dog. Ah, yes, yeah, so Shalika is asking good questions. She says, can we also say Chihuahua C is new dog? And no, you cannot do that because you're not sure that dog will fit into your Chihuahua thing. So uh, think of this as the casting when we were having the, um, I think the doubles that we were going to store as ints or the bytes that we, or the ints that we're going to store as bytes. You can do this when you do a cast to the object. But if you don't do a cast, you cannot do this. You have to tell Java really, I'm really sure that this is going to work. So go ahead and do it. But if you don't do it, it won't, um, it won't work. It'll say, sorry, it doesn't fit. Can't do that. Any other questions? So I got a question. What's the advantage of using OFP? Well, it's a good question. Um, it makes your code more maintainable because you have less duplicate code and it's better split up into logical places. So maintainability is definitely the first one. And well, maintainable application is a good performing application to some extent. So I think this is what I would call the main advantage, that your code is well-structured because you know where to find what, and it's 
uh, code is only being written at one spot. So not at multiple spots, the same code. So you don't have to change many places uh, in order to do change one function or one property. Um, as far as I know, there's not really a disadvantage to OOP um, for the other question. Any other questions? No. This is a difficult topic though. So if you are gonna go through the videos later and you get stuck, please just post it in there and I'll see if I can clarify things, if I can go more in depth or maybe explain something differently to help you get your head around it because it's a really important topic to understand Java well. So for next week again, I would strongly recommend to check out the videos, study all the links that I've been sending you because they go even more in depth. And then I have some lines of homework again. You can probably guess them to some extent because they're going to be very strongly related to OFP. So encapsulation, um, inheritance and polymorphism. Yes, if there are no other questions, then I'm going to wish you a really nice next week. And I hope to see you all next Saturday night. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.